morning, friends, and as we gather around uh, the worship table today, Lord, I just pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you in his love and in his mighty power and presence, and that you just sense the presence of the Lord in your heart as you worship together um, and sing praises to his name. Let's sing together a song that does. Uh, familiar probably to most of you and we've sung it uh, many times in our congregation now great is our god splendor of the king Lord in majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice Give my gift 
to you today. I just hear your voice today. I just follow you. As for me in my house, we will serve you. As for me in my house, we will spend the lives on you today. I choose follow you today. I choose give my yes to you today. I choose hear your voice and live today. Good morning, church. It's uh, it's good to be back with you. As has gone for just a little bit or more than a week, and Shannon and I uh, got to experience uh, reconnecting with some family, some friends uh, back in Alberta. We were able to take in our one of our nieces' graduation celebrations from high school. That was really awesome. We uh, were able to spend some time helping our friends as they. Uh, had a funeral for their mother and so it was really good to, to just be part of all that and uh, certainly good to come back and to be um, together again with with you guys so we're so glad to be able to be back and we're looking forward to uh, church this weekend and we know that it's gonna be a long weekend there's probably lots of, of things going on even in your lives and uh, we just hope and trust that uh, you'll stay connected during this time uh, with you know the family of God with the people of faith and making connections obviously daily with our Lord and uh, we look forward to being together very soon again so we're so glad that you tune in uh, each week and, uh, and listen to the videos and and I hope that the Lord is using those in your personal growth and um, so this morning we're gonna just get into God's Word. We've been journeying through the book of Philippians and we're going to be recapping a little bit of some of Paul's thoughts uh, going 
forward and now that we're into chapter three, just the very end of chapter three and, and a little bit into chapter four this morning, we're going to be, like I said, looking a little bit back some of the things that Paul has said in light of where we're at in our text this morning. So without, you know, any more um, rambling on, let's just get into God's word this morning. So let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for your grace and your goodness, your your living presence in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you do not leave us uh, alone, but that your presence is with us and you are not only our, our, our guide, but you are our teacher. And so, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would teach us the things of Christ today and, and the things that, that we need to maybe be more mindful of as, as we live this life for your glory. Uh, we, want, we want that, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Philippians chapter 3, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. We'll read uh, from verse 15 through chapter 4, verse 3. And Paul says that all of us, he's talking to the church in Philippi, but um, let's take it for ourselves as well. He says, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. And as I was thinking about a title for our message this morning and, and our text this morning, I just thought living the potential, the potential of the life that God has given. So he says, let us live up to that which we've already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I often told you before and, and tell you again, even now with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. Did you hear that, friends? That when we think of Jesus Christ, we think of somebody who can bring everything under his control. That's the power of God and God alone. So that same power, by that power, he says, it will he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and my sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. He says, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Judea and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, th help these women since they've contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So let's get into this text this morning. And I, I think as, as, you know, I was centering on this particular text this week and resting in it, the, the verse that kind of just kept coming out for me, and it was one that I just couldn't get away from, is verse 16, where Paul says to us, he says, you know, my dear friends, he says, let us live up to that which we've already attained. And and in this book, as, as well as when we were in the book of John, you know, whether it's John or whether it's now the apostle Paul journeying us through, you know, life with the Philippian believers, uh, he's, he reminds us, they keep reminding us the things that we have in Jesus Christ, this new and living way that has been opened up by the blood of Jesus Christ and the work that he did and he alone could do on the cross, paying for our salvation, but bringing a freedom that we never knew could exist in life. So now with that in mind, he says, live that out, live up to that which we've already attained. And so the question I just kind of was, you know, that was stirring in my heart or uh, this week is, well, what have we attained? You know, we have this, like I said, this new and living way that has been brought to us through Jesus Christ. And I just, you know, some of the things that kind of came 
in flooding into my mind and my heart this week is just the whole sense of eternal life. And we, we know from the book of John, we know that it is more than just uh, a passport into heaven. It's more than just our, our ticket of, you know, um, of, of redemption and a promise of something that's to come when we die. It's, it's more than that. It's, it's also about what is happening right now, how we get to experience this life this life that Christ has, has paid for, this life that, that Christ has remedied by what he was willing to do, going to a cross, paying a debt that we couldn't pay, uh, and, and that we have received it by faith. So we've been given eternal life. And, and it is the now and the not yet, the now that we can experience this life, we can experience this new and living way brought by Jesus, now friends we don't we, we don't wait until we die to experience it that he says that that the riches of heaven the things that he uh has brought for us they begin now they begin the moment that we say yes to jesus and we start living this life and we start living up to this life and we allow him to work his way through our lives it's now his healing is now his redemption is now his his offer and his promise of of life abundant and full it's now and it's not yet we we get to live with him forever when we die i mean death is just a, a passing over from from one you know uh, sense of what life is like to another now with the lord and in his presence forever what a great thing that is so that's what we've attained. Uh, we've also attained that sense of what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, that we are kingdom, you know, in the kingdom of the Son. Jesus Christ is our King. We are citizens of this new and living way. We're citizens in the kingdom. Jesus is our King. He's our Lord. We are now members of a new kind of family, not just, you know, of blood, but we're, we're members because we're bound together through faith, a kinship of faith, a spiritual family of all who seek to live for God by faith. All who trust in the provision that only Jesus could provide, the work on the cross, and living this dynamic, uh, uh, this, this daily relationship, experiencing God each and every day with God and with his children. So those are some of the, you know, the blessings of, of the potential that is ours, what we have received, and it goes on and on all through scripture. So the question comes, well, how do we live up to that, as Paul talks about, living up to that which we've already attained? Well, just a few thoughts here. We, we press into the things of God. We do. And we, le we, we seek to experience all that he has for us. We, we press into the things of God. In, in other words, Philippians 1 verses 9 to 11 where, where Paul is praying for the Philippian believers. And he says, this is my prayer. He says that your love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That, that love would be... The, the anchoring point of the soul, that love would be the thing that propels you in life. It's our, our motivation. It is our, our, just how we live life, this life of Christ out. He says that you'll be able to discern more and more. And we talked about that, not just what's good, but as Paul says, that you'll be able to discern what is best. And you may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, or for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. In Philippians 3, verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ. And we talked about that, that it's, it's not enough to, to read about God in a, you know, in a, a, a textbook or a, a self-help book. It's not enough to say, I, I know something about him. It's not enough to, to say, well, my, my parents, they were good Christians. It's not enough to say that I go to church and I'm kind of living, 
you know, learning the culture. I'm learning, you know, where to, how to stand and sit and sing the songs and how to express it. It's not about learning a culture. It's about experiencing Christ in our lives. And so he says, I want to know that. I want to experience knowing Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, his resurrection power at work in our lives. And he says, and participating in his sufferings, becoming even like him, even in death. So we press into the things of God. We also, like Paul, need to press on into the things of God. You know, we press forward. We forget those former things. We forget those those things that actually become hindrances for us in living the life that God has for us. Like Paul, when Paul was talking about, you know, his pedigree, his, you know, traditions, his religious upbringing, his, the, the education that he had and, and the ways that he had learned. He had to unlearn those ways. He had to relearn, reteach his mind that it was all about the grace of God. So in Philippians 1.27, he tells us, he says, whatever happens in life, he says, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ, that you are a living testimony, that you are a living proclamation, that you are the gospel story. He's living life through you. And then he says um, in, in verse 14 of chapter 2, he says, do nothing or, or do everything without complaining or arguing. We talked about that, that murmuring spirit that we can have. And boy, it's, it's, it's prevalent in our culture. It is prevalent on social media now more than anything else. Uh, any other time in history, it is so easy to be a murmurer. It is so easy to be a grumbler, a complainer. And Paul says, that's simply not the way of Christ. That's simply not the way that we need to be conducting ourselves. We need to be living a different story. We need to be singing a different song. We need to be living a different kind of life. So we press on. We, we press forward for all that God has for his people, for all that God has for you and for me. And then we live that out. We live out what God brings in to our life with him. So Philippians 2 verses three and four where Paul had said don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit he says rather in humility value others above yourself not looking to your own interests but each of us looking to the interests of others Philippians 1 6 I love this where he says being confident of this he he who began a good work in you he will also carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Aren't we thankful for that? Friends, he is not done with any of us. He's not done with you. He's not done with me. As long as we're breathing, as long as we're living on planet Earth, he, his desire is to work in us, to work out for his glory the things that, that we were meant to be, that the life that we were meant to have in him. And Philippians 2, 13, 12 and 13. Therefore, my f dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So we've got that sense of God is wanting to pour into our lives. He is wanting to bring into our lives a life that is different so that we can pour that out, that we can put flesh and bones, you know, on this life that, that he has brought into our lives through the work of Jesus Christ. I was thinking about a lot of these scriptures and again, that, that kind of core scripture in our text today about living up to what we've already attained. And I was thinking, you know, do we have any real life examples? So I'm gonna ask you to think about that. Do you have any real life examples of that kind of life? I don't know about you, but uh, with the Olympics, you know, on, I've been 
mildly interested in kind of seeing what's going on, seeing how Canada's doing, seeing, you know, how the Canadian women for sure have been, you know, in such a strong showing. But um, it got me thinking, you know, as thinking about my upbringing and how sports was so important in my formative years growing up and how I love I loved every sport, but you know, one that really was kind of close to my heart was baseball. I love baseball. I love that team aspect. I loved always working for that one goal. I, I, I loved so much about the game. And I was thinking about my coach. And you know, all through my years, I really, like as far as my head coach, I had one head coach. I had a few different assistants. One was my best friend's father. It was an assistant coach helping him. But my baseball coach was really kind of my one and only coach all through the years. And I was thinking about his life. And I was thinking about, um, like, his son was our our pitcher. And he was a he was a great great pitcher he was one of the top and you know in our province probably one of the top in western canada at the time um and and so as he got older you know and i was the same age as him as he got older our coach just kind of moved up the ranks with with us and so like i said just had him all my years as as uh, as a baseball player and he had real leadership skills this guy in life uh, time management, the way he could construct a practice to kind of get the most out of us for, you know, skills and drills and just learning to develop ourselves in certain positions, certain game situations. He made the game fun, you know, as we were trying to get better, uh, he still made it a, a very fun thing to be, even be at practice together. Um, he had such a knowledge of, of the game, uh, each position. And if he didn't know something, he would bring somebody in to, to teach a certain part and nuance of, of a, a position or a skill that needed to be developed, how to get better. And, and we had a lot of success as a team. We, you know, won in our, in our cities uh, most, most years in Saskatoon and we went on, we won provincials a time or two. And um, it was great, it was a great time to be a kid. But as I think back now, over his life, I, I think about his his inner life. I think about who he was outside of what I saw in the game of baseball. I mean, even looking back and as a kid, I, I knew that he had struggles. I knew that he, he, he struggled in, in his marriage, just keeping it together. I, I knew that he, he struggled with some, some inner demons of addiction. I, I know that he had a real battle with alcohol. I had seen him battle and lose um, with alcohol many times. I, I, I remember, you know, as a, as a kid who was just a, a teenager, just bef even before uh, those preteen years, I remember him and, and his assistant coach uh, at a tournament bringing or allowing alcohol uh, even to be served to us, you know, in a cooler during a tournament. And, you know, these preteen kids getting getting alcohol, you know, and getting a buzz uh, as they were playing. I just thought, you know, it was just such a, a sad commentary on, on how he struggled in life. And so I think of him in one way as a coach with a, you know, as a very high standard. And I think of him in the other arenas of his life as somebody who um, was a very broken man and had a lot of struggles. And he was one of my key examples growing up in, in life, really, out, outside of the church. And so as I think about him and as, as I grieve some of that for, for him, think about what about your life I mean what are some of your examples who are some of your examples who who are they who are they you know that are examples for you in the kind of life that that God has for you the kind of life where he says you know go on to that which we've already attained what we've already received in Christ Go on in that. Grow up in that. Attain the full measure. And I, I think that for so many of us, we've settled. We settle and we, we are educated way beyond the level of our obedience to Christ. 
and we need to rediscover what is Christ calling us to do and to be and, and who are our examples. And I think as we think about that, I looked at the family of God. I looked at my, my own church family. I looked to our congregation and I say like the family of God that God has brought together here, you know, in Rosedale, Chilliwack area, that family of faith. Those are our examples. And are they perfect? No, no, no. I mean, Paul wasn't perfect. Paul himself, just before this text this morning, he says, not that I've already attained all this, not that I'm all measured up, but I'm pressing on and I'm going forward and I'm going toward that prize that, that Christ Jesus has called me heavenward towards. So even Paul wasn't perfect, and certainly he was not leading and, and speaking to a perfect church in this Philippian congregation, nor would he be speaking to us as perfect believers. But God is at work, and God is changing lives. And my hope and my prayer is that God is at work changing your life, and that each and every day you're growing and you're taking him at his word and you are trusting in him and you are experiencing more and more the life that he has for each of us. So Philippians 3 verses 15 through, through 17 again, as he's speaking to the, the family of God, he says this, he says, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too, God is going to make clear to you. Only let us live up to that which we've already attained. Join with me in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern that we gave you. In the family of God, in this family of faith that God has brought us into, there is a diversity, there's a beautiful diversity. There's a diversity of life, there's even a diversity in are growing in Christ, right? We're not all at the same level. There are some that are those that are mature. There, there are those that are immature. There are those that, that, that come that don't, haven't even connected yet with their Savior. We're hoping and we're praying. We're, we're hoping that we can live an example that is, that is worth emulating, that we can show them a pattern of life that, that really is for the glory of God and, and is everything that they ever thought it could be and more. But even though we're not perfect, there's a wonderful diversity in the family of God. There's this, you know, all levels of the Christian faith, all levels of maturity there. There are examples set by others of living the life of faith. And it was in the Philippian church too. It was in Paul's life as well. And that's why he could say, you know, follow my example. And if, if, you know, you think differently, you know, don't worry about it. God is going to make that clear in time too. There's a diversity of thought as well in the family of God. There's a diversity of thought where he, he says, you know, on some point, if you think differently, that too God is going to make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained and follow follow the ways of Christ and follow examples that mature mindset the apostle Paul had in that and what he's referring to you know that includes the, the this view that knowing Christ it clarifies and it relativizes all other goals in life he, nothing compares nothing else compares to participating in life with Christ. And Jesus Christ isn't j to be, you know, just a, a first priority among, you know, other maybe lesser priorities in life. He is to be the preeminent choice. You know, in in the Old Testament, when God was, was forming his family of faith through the Jewish nation at that time, and he prescribed the, the Ten Commandments. Remember, one of the, the first commandments is don't have any, there's no other gods don't have any other gods besides me. Remember Joshua, when he was leading Israel and he comes to the end of his, his ministry, his leadership and his years of service, and he's about to die. 
And as he's about to pass the torch on to the next generation, he says, look around you to the neighboring nations. And he says, if, you know, if their way of life is attractive to you to the point where you think, you know, that's, that's the life that you want to live. You see, they're, they're not like us. They've been established for a while. They're not nomadic and traveling around. They've got lots. They've got the stuff. And if you think that following their way makes sense, follow it. But he says, it's destruction. It's death. He says, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, there is no other choice. It's God and, and God alone. And there's no other gods. There's no other in our culture. There's, there's many other small g gods. Those things that we put above Christ in our lives. But there should be nothing else. God should be the preeminent choice in our lives. So Paul's mature perspective, it recognized that it's through Jesus' work on the cross that we're made right with God through faith. It's not our performance as, as we looked in, you know, the chapter before where Paul was kind of in tongue-in-cheek humor. He was talking about, oh yeah, I was, a, I was a Pharisee and I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And, you know, he goes on to talk about his pedigree, his family history and his chosen profession and, and all those things. And then in the end he says, they're all, it's just all like cow dung. It's, it's all rubbish. It's all, you know, junk compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ, knowing Christ. So he, he recognizes that it's the work of Christ and Christ alone. It's not through our performance. It's not through our family. It's not through our religious history, but it's simply every day putting your trust in the grace that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul's view here, his mature view, it also includes the desire to participate in the way of life that Christ models, that, that cross-shaped life, you know, that cross-shaped focus, that focus on giving ourselves away, giving of ourselves for the sake of others, especially that they might know the good news, that they might see a different kind of life that can be lived. Paul's view also includes the ability to see that he has not attained all of this. He hasn't become a, a perfect human being, but he, is, he has got this goal of growth, this goal of becoming more and more like Christ, this more and more of a self-giving uh, you know, life. But he doesn't let his, his past define his future. He presses on, he continues on in the work that God has given him. That's what God is calling us to be, family. That's what God is calling you in your family to be. Paul encourages the whole community of faith to share in the, this perspective of the mature here. But he recognizes we're not all there, right? He, we're not all there. We're all at different places and different stages in our Christian growth. So he doesn't get all bent out of shape in this. He he provides the example, he, he exhorts them and encourages them on their way, but he, in a sense here, he just says, God is going to be your guide in this. If you think differently than me in this, God's going to continue to be your guide. He's going to be continuing to work in your life. That's the promise, right? Philippians 1.16, he who began a good work in me, he's also going to be faithful to complete it. So we allow him to do his good work. And so we don't need to be always, you know, like, like social media is now, where we, we're calling somebody out, we're calling somebody, somebody to task, we're calling somebody to, to you know, to, to this side or that side of any issue and coin. We allow God to work by His grace in our lives and to continue that work. For Paul, Christ, or the, the way of Christ was the way of the cross. And for Paul, the way of Christ was a life of sacrificial love. Not denying 
you know, self-denial, like where we give up certain things and, and all that. There's a time and a place for that, but he's talking about more than just giving up certain things. He's talking about a life where it's denial of self. It's where myself isn't ruling. Myself isn't the Lord of my life. Myself desire is not the thing that is calling the shots in my life, but God is calling the shots. God is the one who is directing my life, is looking for the good in others, is looking out for their interests. It also means living out a life of forgiveness, understanding Christ has forgiven me. He's forgiven me. And now I live that out for others. I look at their faults. I look at their sins. And I choose to forgive. You see, friends, the cross is the central symbol in the Christian life. Because it means something. It means that God makes a way for our forgiveness. God has made a way for a new life that is possible only through the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we're made acceptable to God. The cross is the central theme also of a life of you and I growing in discipleship, growing more and more like Christ. And Jesus commands all who would be his followers, and that includes right now, here, today in Chilliwack, all who would be his followers to daily take up your cross and follow him. And it's interesting, the words that Paul uses, you know, where he describes those that, that aren't there, those that are on the other side of life, those that are really enemies, he says, to the cross of Christ in verse 19. And he, he listen to what he says about them. He says their, their destiny is destruction. So in other words, they don't have life. They don't have the light of life running through their veins. It's death. Spiritually, it's death. Their destiny is destruction. He says their God is their stomach. He says their glory is their shame. I, I want you, friends, I want us to be thinking about how he describes that, them. And then I want you to think about the way of life that Paul has adopted and what it is that he's calling us to follow. He says, instead of that, instead of destiny being destruction, instead of the God being, you know, the God of your stomach and the glory of your shame, he says, have the mind of Christ. He says, the mind of Christ is the way of the cross, friends. He says, it's about thinking about others above ourselves. He says, it's living to be to serve instead of being served. And it's submitting ultimately to the Father's will and the Father's ways in our lives. And so when Paul speaks about, you know, those whose destiny is destruction and the, their God is their stomach and they glory in their shame, he's pointing to a way of life that is, that is at opposite ends of the kingdom of God. And kingdom people and the way of Christ. He says it's a life that is it's self-focused. It's self-absorbed. It is, it is what can I get in the now? What can I get in the moment? What will satisfy my life right here, right now with no thought and no regard to, to the rest of my life? But it's about what can I receive? What's going to bring me the most happiness right here, right now? How can I, you know, get out of this life of dissatisfaction the quickest. And so the quickest measure is looking at what's going to make me happy instead of who's going to make me holy. It's about living under that directorship instead of the directorship and the lordship of Christ in our lives. And so then Paul reminds them right after that, he reminds them of their true citizenship. He reminds them that they're Christ's and their citizenship is in heaven. And so he reminds them and he reminds each of us that it's about living up to that which we've already attained in Christ. And that includes living it out when it's difficult. 
living it out when it doesn't always make seem to make the most sense living it out when we're with difficult people and difficult life situations and circumstances that's when the gospel really comes alive in our lives in our relationships and I've said before people are tricky you know relationships are tricky sometimes they get messy because we can't control how people are gonna respond we can't control even how people are gonna think and so relationships get strained people get disappointed feelings get hurt and it goes on and it goes on and so Paul begins in chapter 4 after talking about you as my brothers and my sisters in the Lord, he, you know, my joy and my crown, he has such a love and affection for this Philippian church. Then he just goes into real life for a moment and he says, these women, they have been at my side. They've been contending for the gospel of Jesus Christ along with me. And now they're contentious together. They're, they're, destroying the work of God because they just can't get along. They can't see eye to eye and they can't see a way forward. And so he just brings this, this real life situation that probably Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus mentioned to Paul and it broke his heart. And so he talks about Euodia and Syntyche and his request to these women is simple. Be of the same mind in the Lord and and that just kind of echoes you know what he said in in chapter 2 remember in chapter 2 he says is if you've gotten anything at all out of a falling out of following Christ if his love has made any difference in your life if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you if you have a heart if you care he says then do me a favor agree with each other Love each other. Be deeply spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to help a, to lend a helping hand. That would have been good words to these ladies. And sometimes, you know, like, Paul here, he, he engages others into their situation. Sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need somebody on the outside, maybe that isn't as invested in, in the moment, to kind of look at the situation and maybe give an objective view, maybe a more God-centered view of, of how things really should go down, how things need to proceed, how things need to go forward. But the bottom line is, live in forgiveness. As we live in the forgiveness of Christ, we need to make decisions, godly decisions, to not hang on to, to hurts, not hang on to disappointments, to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. Relationships are effort. They take work. And Paul says, make every effort, make every effort. And then the only reason he says that is because it takes effort. Sometimes our relationships take a lot of effort, but our goal should be the same. You know, the goal is the gospel, getting the gospel out. And if there's a hindrance to the gospel getting out because, you know, you're at odds with somebody, do what you can to make it right. Do what you can to mend the hurt. Do what you can to clarify. Do what you can to submit. Do what you can. In the name of Christ Jesus. Romans 12, 17 to 21 says, Don't repay anyone evil for evil, but he says, Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. As it's, as it's written, it's, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So in other words, leave the judgment, leave how that's going to play out, leave it to the Lord. He says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, he says, you'll 
heap burning coals on his head. And I used to look at that verse and think, what in the world is Paul talking about to, to the Romans? He's, it's actually an Old Testament imagery of, of someone in, in, uh, in ashes that was a sign of repentance, that the Lord was working in his life and he was making a change. And that's the goal is that, you know, as, as we do what we can to mend relationships and to move forward and to not let things be hindrances for, for us and for the body of Christ and for the gospel going forward, we hope that what, what comes is a, an atmosphere for all of us of repentance, of, of life change, of getting it right with the Lord and with each other. He says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We walk in step with the Spirit, which means we walk out of step in the opposite spirit with the world systems and how the world views things and how the world says, you know what, if they, if they tick you off, just move on. Just move on. It's easier. It's better. It's healthier. Your mental health depends on it. Well, maybe. But more often than not, God is just calling you to be his servant in that situation, to be humble, to be teachable, and to walk in humility, and to try and mend fences and do what you can to be not part of the problem, but part of the situation. Let's pray. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul reminds us again, work out your salvation, work out this life that God has given to us. You know, in light of the awesome nature of God and in, in light of his love and his mercy for us, we're reminded it's God's desire and it's God's ability to do this. He's enabling us to live differently because God himself is working in us. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray that even in times of conflict that we're gonna have a, a humble and a receptive and responsive approach to our relationships with each other. Pray that we would be willing when necessary to seek restitution wherever relationships need to be mended and that as a church that we'd be eager to find positive ways forward. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word and your ways. I thank you for the Apostle Paul who reminds us of this life that we need to live up to. We thank you that he reminds us that you are at work, God, within our lives, that you are making us holy, that we need to just avail ourselves to the living God and you'll do what we can't do. Lord, help us to be fence menders. Help us to want to restore relationships. Help us to want to repent when necessary. Give us that desire to move forward and to be the family of faith that is a living testament and testimony to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.